Following is an AZPM original production. Arizona Science is supported by Research Corporation for Science Advancement. For Arizona Public Media, I'm Tim Swindle, Professor Emeritus of Planetary Science at the University of Arizona, and this is Arizona Science. Joining me today is Kat Volk, a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson. Welcome, Kat. Thanks for having me. Kat, you've recently been studying an object called 2020 VN40 that is in an unusual orbit out beyond Neptune. What's so unusual about it? So it's unusual in the way it does its gravitational dance with Neptune. So it's a part of the trans-Neptunian object population, so TNOs, also known as the Kuiper Belt or Kuiper Belt Objects. And a lot of these objects are in orbital resonances with Neptune, meaning they are doing a kind of repeated gravitational dance with the planet that controls their orbital evolution over long time scales. So the cool thing about this new object is that it's doing the dance in a different way that we did not think was a possibility before we discovered this object. So what do you mean by a resonance? Is it going around a certain number of times every time Neptune goes around once? or Yeah, so the most famous resonant object in the outer solar system is Pluto. Uh, Pluto orbits the sun twice for every three times Neptune orbits the sun. This new object goes around the sun just once for every 10 times Neptune goes around the sun. We call that a 10 to 1 resonance. It takes about 1,600 years to go around the sun, so that's a very long orbital period. And we have now only observed it since 2020. So that tells you how short a time period we've observed it compared to how long it takes to go around the sun. Why are so many of these objects in resonances? It turns out that resonances are very powerful in sculpting these small body populations over time. And different types of resonant objects ended up in their resonances for different reasons. Some objects were captured into Neptune's resonances when the giant planets rearranged themselves. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune didn't form where we see them today. They formed in a slightly more compact configuration with uh, especially Neptune and Uranus closer to the sun than they are today. And then they spread out after they formed in response to interactions with the early Kuiper Belt or trans Neptunian populations. And during that migration and rearrangement process, a lot of things got captured into Neptune's resonances. But Neptune is also actively capturing new objects into resonances today. So Neptune is constantly kind of tossing around objects in the outer solar system, and some of them will be temporarily snagged into resonances as this happens over time. And to be in one of these resonances, a lot of things like Pluto always manages to not be there when Neptune's there, right? Does this do that same sort of thing? It's doing a different version of that thing. So it's actually a perfect illustration of why this one is weird. So when Pluto comes to its closest approach to the sun, it always does so roughly 90 degrees away from where Neptune is, so that when it's making its closest approach, it's never going to have a direct close encounter with Neptune. This object actually can come to prefer a configuration where it's lined up with Neptune at its closest approach. But it still isn't going to have a close encounter, and that is because it has a really highly inclined or tilted orbit. So that's another thing that's special about this object. Um, The survey that discovered it was looking very far away from the plane of the planets. It's the Large Inclination Distant Objects Survey. So this object has a higher inclination than typical objects that have been discovered in surveys that have been done closer to the plane of the planets. And that's part of why we had never seen this particular resonant dance before, because we thought, well, when you're relatively close to the plane of the planets, even though Pluto has a substantial inclination, it's smaller than this new object, um, you want to avoid being lined up with Neptune when you're making your closest approach. But this object has such a big inclination that its closest approach to the sun is actually not when it has its strongest interaction with Neptune. Its strongest interaction actually happens when it crosses the plane of the planets to cross through where all the planetary bodies and most of the objects in the solar system are. And that's what allows it to do this different resonant interaction, which was really unexpected. How close does it actually get to Neptune? Not very close. Its closest approach to the sun, I think, is about 46 AU, and 1 AU is the Earth-Sun distance, and Neptune is at 30 AU. 
So it's actually somewhat surprising that it can have um, such a strong interaction with the planet, despite not coming that close. You said that the resonances are more likely to be sculpted by Neptune than some of the other, um, Jupiter's a much bigger planet. Why is that? So Neptune's just the closest planet to these objects. And because it is our outermost planet in the solar system, its resonances kind of have free reign in the outer part of the solar system with no interference from the other giant planets. Although Uranus can come into play a little bit. It is the next planet in from Neptune, and it actually is close to being in a resonance with Neptune itself. So Uranus and Neptune can interact, which can affect how Neptune's resonances show up in the outer solar system. Do you have any idea how big this object is? No. We have what is called an H-magnitude estimate, which is a brightness estimate. So we know how much light it's reflecting. And we can get a size estimate from that. But it's not going to be a perfect size estimate because we don't know how reflective or basically shiny the object is. There is an H-magnitude estimate, which can be estimated to a diameter, but it's going to be, you know... a it's not going to be very precisely known, which is true of most of the objects in the outer solar system. We only have rough estimates of how big they are. About 100 years ago, Pluto was discovered, and it was classified as a planet for a while. And uh, whether or not it's a planet, uh, we'll leave that alone. But there are a bunch of objects out there now, right? Yeah. I think we are up to about 4,000 known trans-Neptunian objects and Kuiper Belt objects. And how are these being discovered? Most of them are discovered by dedicated searches. There are some that are serendipitously found by other surveys. And then there are also people who go through surveys that were performed for other science goals. And then someone reprocessed the data. Well, a whole team of someone's reprocessed the data to discover uh, several hundred TNOs in that data set. But most of the TNO discoveries are from dedicated surveys that were looking specifically for TNOs. Are we likely to find anything substantially bigger than Pluto out there? I think so. I think it's pretty likely. Um, so a little bit later this year, the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory is going to start the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And the estimate is that it will detect about 40,000 trans-Neptunian objects in the outer solar system. And it seems quite likely to me that, you know, there's a distribution of sizes for these objects. So it would be really weird if we'd already found the biggest ones with our much smaller scale surveys with only, you know, 10% the detections. And, you know, there, there could be even planet-sized objects out there. We don't actually yet have perfect observational constraints on that. Well, thanks for coming in and talking with us, Kat. Thanks so much, Tim. Our guest today has been Kat Volk, who studies the objects in the outer solar system, particularly those who spend most of their time further from the sun than Neptune. This is Tim Swindle, and you've been listening to Arizona Science. You can also listen to this and other Arizona Science segments by going to the AZPM website at azpm.org. Thank you to Research Corporation for Science Advancement for their support of Arizona Science. AZPM podcasts are made possible in part by donations from listeners like you. Learn more at support.azpm.org. Thank you.